and uh, acknowledge also Minister Tsipras and Ambassador Burns and several other very good and distinguished friends in the audience this morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here in Skopje. The last time I was here was a little over a year ago, and at that time the governments here and in Athens were in the, uh, they were wrapping up the negotiations to resolve the name dispute. The PRESPA agreement is a historic accomplishment that opens a new chapter in relations between Greece and North Macedonia. It creates opportunities for regional trade and investment, paves the way for North Macedonia's integration into NATO and the European Union. But maybe the most important thing about PRESPA is the demonstration effect that it creates for the entire Western Balkan Peninsula. PRESPA is the latest in a series of events which suggest that the momentum, to use a term from the conference title today, that the momentum in the Western Balkans is indeed moving in favor of the West. The addition of three Western Balkan states to NATO, uh, the border agreement between Kosovo and Montenegro, the friendship treaty between North Macedonia and Bulgaria, the closing of EU accession chapters for Serbia and Montenegro, and the new recommendation to open accession processes for Albania and North Macedonia. All of these are positive developments that would have been unimaginable a generation ago. But I would argue that they mask deeper trends that should give us pause. The reality is that in many parts of the Balkans today, power and influence are shifting away from the West to outside players whose modes of government and economy are very different from those that we have aspired to see the countries of this region embrace since the 1990s. The future that Russia and China have in mind for the Western Balkans is not one of individual liberty and free markets, but of dependency and exploitation. The speed with which these two players have consolidated their position comes as a surprise to many Western observers. For much of the past 30 years, we have operated on the assumption that the West would not, for the foreseeable future, face a peer competitor capable of mounting a serious challenge to our ideals or to our security. History in any meaningful geopolitical or ideological sense of the term seemed to have ended after 1989. The world of 2019 looks very different from what we imagined at the vantage point of the 1990s. Russia has rebuilt its military, invaded two neighbors, resurrected influence along its western frontiers, and is projecting power in the Middle East, North Africa, and Latin America. China did not fulfill our hopes of convergence with the West, but rather has flaunted international rules and abused market access to build up its military and launch an ambitious agenda for global geopolitical influence. Both of these powers are resolutely authoritarian and seek to harness economic growth to political repression and control. Both are using the means at their disposal to seek the things that empires throughout history have sought, territory, resources, and prestige. We are today in the early stages of what is likely to be a pro protracted competition among the world's largest powers. In China, we see for the first time a competitor with the potential to surpass the West in wealth, technology, and military strength. And we are waking up to this challenge late, at a moment when our rivals are well advanced in their bid for influence, and when our own societies are internally divided and rethinking their role in the world. As geopolitics returns, the Western Balkans and neighboring regions are becoming ground zero in a strategic, economic, and ideological contest between the free West and authoritarian East. <clears throat> Waging and winning this competition should be a priority for America and Europe, because what happens in the ba Balkans matters to the Western world. Historically, the importance of the Balkan Peninsula lay in its geography between Eurasia and the Levant and Europe. From antiquity, outside powers have exploited this peninsula's exposure to the sea on three sides and its numerous mountain passes to project power into Europe. The same mountains that favored the development of multiple small states eased the process by which non-Western powers could dominate the region, whether through conquest exploiting ethnic differences, or co-opting weak states from within. Today, that same geography is being exploited by China as an easy access point through which to enter Europe and impede Western unity. But the importance of the Balkans in history has not only been about geopolitics. 
It's also been about the quest for freedom. For centuries, the aspirations of Balkan peoples for independence from Ottoman rule inspired Western support for democracy in this region. The Dayton Agreement of 1995 showed that America and Europe possessed both the political will and military ability to underwrite the existence of multi-ethnic states following the breakup of Yugoslavia. In the ensuing quarter century, the West has used its power to advance self-determination, individual freedom, rule of law, and free market reform as accelerants to incorporating the Balkans into NATO and the EU. It is this modern Western vision for the Balkans that is being tested by the return of geopolitics. Like earlier powers in history, Russia and China are exploiting Balkan geography and politics to advance their strategic and commercial aims at the international level. Russia has been a factor in the Balkans since the mid-18th century. Its interests here have always been tied to Russian interests in the Black Sea region. Economically, the Black Sea is a conduit for a large portion of Russian trade and energy flows. Militarily, the Black Sea provides a launch pad from which to project power into the Mediterranean and beyond. Achieving preponderance in the Black Sea requires that, the, that Russia prevent the consolidation of Western presence and institutions in the Western approaches to this body of water. To that end, Moscow cultivates pro-Russian governments and parties and stokes ethnic and historical discord in regional conflicts to prevent governments from moving closer to the West. As long as the Western Balkans are in turmoil, the Eastern Balkans, Romania and Bulgaria, will remain an isolated NATO salient, and the West will have to divide its attention between the Balkans, Baltic, and Ukraine. By contrast, China is a newcomer to the Balkans. The Belt Road Initiative is the most ambitious geopolitical project of the modern era, seeking nothing less than the physical connection of the eastern and western extremities of the Eurasian landmass. The Balkan Peninsula is the buckle in this belt, the physical link for China's maritime and overland routes to Europe. The first of these proceeds from the South China Sea across the Indian Ocean into the Mediterranean and finds its terminus in the Adriatic. The second moves from the Chinese mainland across Central Asia through the Balkans into Europe. For both of these projects to succeed, China needs infrastructure in the Balkans. Ports at Piraeus, Trieste, and Rijeka provide entrepots in close proximity to the largest ports of the Eastern Mediterranean. Stretching inland from these ports and connecting them to Europe are a growing number of Chinese road, rail, bridge, and airport projects. These projects benefit China by providing access to the European internal market, by fulfilling the need to export economic demand in the aftermath of the 2009 economic crisis. China's investments come in the form of loans and export credits that are contingent upon the use of Chinese companies and labor. They are not investment in the classic sense, but something more like externalized Chinese stimulus projects. These loans do not encourage fiscal stability. They increase debt loads, reinforce corruption, and undercut efforts at building up local industry. They expose small economies to gyrations in the Chinese market and subject regional uh, leaders to political leverage from Beijing. Russian and Chinese activities tend to reinforce one another. Russia wants to destabilize. China wants dependencies. Neither wants to see healthy democracies in this region. Russia, because that would propel the expansion of Western institutions. China, because it would bring a degree of scrutiny, transparency, and accountability that would jeopardize its economic projects. And both see the Western Balkans as a proving ground for validating their model of kleptocracy and state control as a counter to Western democracy and markets. In thinking about the future, our goal must be, as it has been in the past, a Balkan peninsula populated by democratic states that abide by the principles of rule of law, between which the potential for conflict has been ameliorated, where multi-ethnic state competition is protected and geopolitical and macroeconomic stability are secured through integration with Western institutions. The countervailing vision is of a region with weak governments, susceptible to manipulation by authoritarian powers, where business is built on venality and corruption, economies are overleveraged, and historic disputes have the potential to boil over into conflict. It's not a foregone conclusion that the Western vision will win. To counter Russian and Chinese inroads, America and Europe must compete for positive influence. That begins by showing up more often. Our rivals often outmaneuver us 
because they spend more of the main currency of diplomacy time in this region. We need greater diplomatic engagement and increased public diplomacy to showcase the many positive impacts that Western aid have had in the Balkans, not only with states that have historically been aligned with the West, but also with those with whom we have often disagreed. In this effort, we should differentiate ourselves from the tactics of authoritarian powers. The modern West stands out from past great powers who have vied for influence in the Balkans in that we have sought neither territory nor dependencies, but rather the encouragement of democratic self-determination. Unlike our rivals, we seek strong independent countries whose governments enter freely into alliances and are able to decide their own future. China and Russia are gaining ground because they are often perceived as being better than the West at keeping promises. 16 years have passed since the EU committed itself to a policy of integration in, in this region at Thessaloniki. When, when countries do the hard work of conflict resolution and reform, it's important that the prospect of accession <clears throat> for which they have labored follow in due course. If the goal of EU membership comes to be seen as unattainable, something else will fill the void whether de facto Chinese protectorates or old visions of states drawn on ethnic lines. For this reason, Balkan states, including, including those who have made it into the EU, must see that when they deliberately impede their neighbor's path to the EU on the basis of old historical grievances, they are undermining their own country's future prosperity and stability. Both the West and the countries of this region have a responsibility to make it harder for authoritarian powers to gain influence on the cheap. Beijing is responding to infrastructure and liquidity gaps that the West itself has failed for decades to address. We need to work harder at providing Western alternatives to Chinese in, uh, financing and encouraging regional governments to strengthen screening mechanisms for foreign investment, dumping, and political influence. Finally, the West must show that it remains solvent in the single most important attribute of great power influence, the ability to bring peace. The promise of bringing peace was a central value proposition of the Western order in the Balkans after the collapse of Yugoslavia. Our vested interest in seeing Balkan conflicts sustainably resolved and the civilizational value that we place on this goal sets the West apart from China, which seeks a superficial stability under which corrupt deals can flourish, and from Russia, which seeks the perpetuation of conflict to advance its geostrategic goals. In pursuing peace in the Balkans, we should take advantage of the positive demonstration effect that each new breakthrough brings. The Balkans are a place where examples resonate. PRESPA was made possible in part by the momentum that carried over from NATO accession from Montenegro. In turn, the name agreement positively influences prospects for the, Pristina, uh, the belgrade Pristina dialogue. The patterns we see in the Western Balkans today are replicated in vulnerable frontiers from the post-Soviet space to Central Europe, the Eastern Mediterranean, and Southeast Asia. In an era of renewed strategic competition, we have to recognize the permanence of geopolitics even as we strive to support ideals that supersede it. We have to stick to the goals of political and economic freedom that have animated past Western policy in this region, but give up the notion that history is automatically on our side just because our ideals are virtuous. In short, we have to compete we owe it to ourselves and to the peoples of the Western Balkans to apply ourselves energetically to that task. Thank you. How can you convince them that this agreement is good? It's good for the people of the Republic of North Macedonia. It's good for the, for the, for the region uh, more broadly. Um, how do you think you can respond to the concerns of, the, of, of, of your own population about, about this agreement? What can be done? Um, uh, over the course of the next year or two to change the perception that this maybe was a setback or a defeat, that something was lost. So thank you very much. Thank you once again to Wes because he was with us, me and Alexis, and also our governments when we try to, to invent the right words to prepare the agreement. Uh, there was a lot of friends also from European member countries who work with us to encourage us. And it's really rare kind of agreement what we achieve. That kind of agreement, history mentioned it only that was achieved after wars. Uh, when the leaders, after victims, uh, need to sit in the table and to achieve this agreement. Really the agreement is, uh, as I mentioned, a good example 
for a solutions of uh, similar issues in the other regions in the world, world level. Uh, from this agreement, normally we pass through very uh, tensic and serious months, but the benefits come and will come uh, in the next period of time more and more because like every agreement bring a benefits, but this agreement, first of all, make a partnership between North Macedonia and Greece. First neighbors, Greece is our south neighbor and after I don't know how many years, maybe centuries, we have a first visit from Prime Minister here in North Macedonia, Prime Minister from Greece here in North Macedonia, together with more than 200 businessmen in a forum who use it like uh, to, for B2B meetings and to open opportunity for cooperation between, between them. The first benefits, what we'll expect, will be economic benefits, and they are present now. The trade between North Macedonia and Greece in the last one year, it's, uh, it's increased 20.8%. It's a huge. Mm -hmm. It increased with Bulgaria 17%, for example. So the first signal that the agreements bring a benefit is that. Normally, the citizens will believe and will pass through this sensitivity only if they feel the benefits. That means not only economic benefits. For us, that means standards. For, for us, that means ruling of law better health system, better education system, sharing experience with our neighbors, strength relations in the regional level. If the region increase cooperation, even Western uh, countries from the European Union will appreciate us very much and we intend to cooperate with the Balkans uh, more than, than, than now. So that is the, the, the global expectation of all of us. This small country here in the heart of the Balkan is uh, in front of the strategic goals uh, more than 27 years to be a member of NATO and to be a member of European Union. With this agreement, especially with PRESPA agreement, we achieve our strategic goals. And these strategic goals have reasons. Why? Because there is no prosperity, there is no future, there is no economic, better economic standard if it's not secure, stable, and um, uh, prosperity here in the region. NATO bring that. European Union integration, it's path for us. We go for the next step, but the next step mere mean uh, continuous uh, motivation, continuous focus for the citizens, for the institutions, for the government, for the parliament here, to increase the capacity of the, of the state and to go in the process of the transformation to be a better competitive society in the global market normally. And as I mentioned it, the numbers are very shining and very hopeful. As you mentioned it, it's not enough. We need bigger increase than 4%, than 5% maybe, because we have um, a low basis of start, but also we have a huge potential. Our low economic standard, it's a motivation for profit for the companies, but for us, it's uh, achieving a goal of bigger GDP, new jobs for young people, new export normally, and strengthening our economy. Together with the investment came know-how, no come experience, and that will bring uh, the, the better future for the citizens. But the good news from the Western Balkan are very visible. Balkan is not anymore tamping bomb. It's a shining example, it's a hopeful. It's an example that our place is uh, uh, together with uh, other European Union member countries. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Prime Minister. Wes, did you want to add anything to that? I would just add, uh, from my perspective, uh, how this process has played out, I think it's very important to acknowledge the um, efforts and risks that were taken on the ground in both countries to arrive at this agreement. It was not an easy process, and a lot of history and emotion was in, involved for both of these countries. Uh, I think it's important to see in North Macedonia's case to see PRESPA in the context of a number of other, uh, uh, many years of other agreements and efforts that have been made from ORID through the efforts vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Bulgaria and then PRESPA, uh, a country that has shown itself uh, a kind of positive example of a multi-ethnic state. So 
Uh, in Greece's case, I think it's important to view it in the context of the remarkable recovery from the economic crisis. Uh, and in that sense, I think for the West to look at this regionally, the most important thing in my mind from a US and European perspective is to show concretely that when leaders in the region take risks and arrive at a local solution, and it was a local solution, which I think is important to uh, keep in mind, Europe and the United States provided support, we provided context, uh, but this was a decision that only the leaders in these two countries could reach. It's important to show that when those risks and sacrifices are made, that uh, a, the, the economic and political benefits follow in due course. And that's why I think the NATO accession process and the opening of the process with the EU are now so important. And that's really a question more for the West, for the EU and for the United States at present than it is for uh, countries in this region. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to um, take some questions from the floor, if there are any, so um, please put up your hands if you would like to ask a question. Um, while you're thinking, um, another question uh, for both of you. So uh, there was a time uh, when the phrase at these events used to be that the EU was the only game in town. Do you all remember this uh, phrase? Um, Every conference you would go to on, uh, about the Balkans, was that was the mantra. The EU is the only game in town. It's the only real player. Um, that's not to say that the US was not uh, a pivotal player at very key moments. Um, but it has seemed to be the case that the US has neglected this region for some time. Now there seems to be some very active uh, diplomacy going on. And um, you know, we know that your old boss, uh, Mike Pompeo, is, um, is, is visiting the region um, later, later this week. Uh, so what's, what can we expect after PRESPA? What's, what's on the agenda? Well, the first thing I would say is I don't think it's altogether fair to characterize uh, the U.S. as having been inactive in this region. Uh, I think we've, we never really left the Western Balkans. We've been very active uh, diplomatically and maintained close relationships with the countries across the region. We, we do have a military presence uh, regionally in support of uh, uh, K4. Uh, and also we've been very supportive politically of the track to NATO for, for now actually four Balkan states. Uh, so uh, keeping that in mind, I think what you're referring to that is accurate is a kind of demunition uh, in U.S. strategic interest in a number of regions, and I think the Western Balkans would be one of those, certainly off of the baseline of the 1990s. And I think that process occurred uh, partly due to the focus on the Middle East that we saw from, the two, from 2001 onward. Uh, and that's not a criticism of past policy, that's just a recognition of where the central focus of, of US and Western policy was at that time. But I think what has occurred in the last few years, and it is, um, I think it's symbolized by the focus in the national security strategy, the national defense strategy, is the realization that while the West has been focused on the Middle East, and while we have assumed this post-Cold War environment in which institutions could spread without obstacle and in which we really didn't face a serious strategic or ideological competitor of the kind that we did in the 20th century, that things have emerged and begun filling vacuums. And I would say that that's true in the Western Balkans as well as in Central and Eastern Europe, Eastern Mediterranean, uh, parts of, the, of Asia Pacific. Uh, and you would certainly rather wake up late than never, but I think we have awakened uh, in the West, both in, in the United States and in Europe, I think we've awakened to the fact that Russia was never really uh, down and out as a military and strategic player in the way that we had imagined it would be after 89. Uh, but also that China is a purposeful strategic actor that has a very sophisticated plan for how it will comport itself in the world. And you see that in Chinese military spending, which has increased 750% in the last decade. That's by Chinese pu public uh, accounting. That's probably not the real figure. Uh, but you also see it in the scale of infrastructure and economic investment that the Chinese are making in these regions. So I think what you're referring to is both in the United States and I think also increasingly in Europe, a realization that unless we compete for positive influence, um, politically, economically, strategically, that there are other perfectly willing and determined and capable 
entities that will fill that void. Thanks. Prime Minister, is that something that, um, that kind of assessment, one that you share of the, the role of uh, China and, and Russia? Uh, I mean, the EU as well has recently declared China to be a strategic uh, competitor. Um, and um, do you think that uh, there isn't a legitimate role for China and Russia in this region? Um, is the influence of these players wholly malign, or is there not, for historic and other reasons, you know, a, a legitimate presence for, for Russia in the, in the region? Um, and if there is a vacuum, and there's small countries that are looking for investment that desperately need investment in public infrastructure and so on, um, is it not a natural thing that they should be looking to, to China? Okay, I think not only the Republic of North Macedonia, but also other countries have only one option to increase cooperation with the rest of the world. For us, there is no alternative than NATO and European Union. Our citizens, more than 80%, are in favor of this integration. Why? Because they believe of standards and benefits that we will bring. But the um, opportunity to cooperate with everybody, it's an um, obligation for the politicians because that will bring a better life for our citizens. And uh, yes, uh, the presence of the companies from China, from Russia, from United States, from Western Europe, is very visible here in the whole region. But also Western Europe have cooperation also with Russia, United States, with uh, China and even the United States try to increase cooperation in a better way with bigger forces in the world level normally. Uh, we are really desperate for better investment for infrastructure. Why? Because without infrastructure, there is no prosperity or no enough prosperity here in the region. And one of the best things that's happened here is first uh, from European Union point of view, uh, Berlin process, um, the connectivity agenda, uh, improve the connections here in the region. Mm. But in the end of the day, we are also in internal discussion how to increase our cooperation inside of the region. There is a huge potential. We have good cooperation, but the potential in front of us is huge. We try harder and harder. That is part, part, uh, that is part of the Berlin process, but also European economic area normally. And we try to be more visible. And also, with our connection, we will be more desired market for other investors, for traders, for companies, normally. And the final intention is to stop this migration, what we have it here. Young people leave the region. Now I understand that everything is a global village. OK. But every nation needs to fight to keep young population, to keep young people, because they are motor power of every society. And they will remain here if we have even close to the, you mentioned it, not maybe with Germany, with Great Britain, with, with France, but Visegrad's group, why not? Or the, this last uh, European Union member countries who became a members. So that is the target. And if the growth there is 1.5, 2%, 2.5, we need to have minimum 4%, 4.5, 5%, growth if we want to get better and quick steps to be closer with them. So, you know, we are liberal market. It's very open. Normally, we believe in values, and we stand behind these values, and we want to increase these values here. Somebody mentioned it to me, OK, if it's another disappointment from the European Union, what you will do? We will bring Europe here, for sure. Probably because we don't have another alternative. Mm. We believe in values. We want to be equal with European countries and, of course, uh, to, to give this opportunity to our citizens. Thank you, Prime Minister. So let me see if there's um, a question from the floor. Um, yes, we have one over here. Please, can you say your name and who you are representing? And short questions, please. Igor Poptrykov from... Uh, Pyramid Upside Down, a question from Mr. Wes Mitchell. Uh, your uh, uh, headquarters uh, of uh, NATO and of the State Department required for certain people that are employed of, uh, in this government. Uh, 
uh, to be replaced due to their connections or affiliation with Russia. But uh, this requirement was uh, uh, requested uh, about two years ago, but no changes uh, till now. Uh, do you have any second thoughts uh, regarding this issue and what is your advice to this government? Because as you know, it is not uh, easy for somebody to get at the blacklist uh, in America, but it is even more difficult to leave this uh, blacklist. Thank you. Are you collecting them or do you want me to respond now? Uh, you can respond. Okay. I'm not familiar with what exactly you're referring to, uh, so I'm not sure how helpful I can be on that question. Let me um, try to answer it this way and say broadly, I think there has been concern in the United States and in uh, European capitals about the scale of Russian influence in many Western Balkan countries for some time now. I think that's very well known, uh, both from the standpoint of uh, uh, manipulation of uh, cor cor corruption in the region and pathways of corruption, but also from the standpoint of spreading disinformation and seeking to undermine uh, democratically elected governments in the region. And you need look no further than Montenegro and the attempted coup there to see how far the Kremlin will go to try to undermine governments from within. So I think that concern is a broad Western concern that has existed for some time now. Um, but the specifics of what you're referring to, uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with that. Thank you, Wes. There's a question here, gentlemen, in the second row. Have we got a microphone? Um. Um, thank you, John. Um, um, thank you very much for your speeches. And um, first of all, to congratulate you on, on the agreement that you um, succeeded with, uh, with Greece. What I would like to ask Mr. Mitchell is um, regards um, uh, the role of the, United, of the European Union and how does the uh, United States actually um, project and uh, you know, give the example of the EU uh, as the road for um, the countries in the Western Balkans? Because, and forgive my kind of, um, kind of critical approach because I come from the United Kingdom and I see often an uneasy relationship between uh, the European Union in the United States. So what kind of message are we giving, you know, as transatlantic partners regarding the role of the EU when there is this kind of uneasy relationship? Mm. I think that's a very good question. Thank you. Uh, let me start by saying that in the Western Balkans, uh, for all of the dissonance that you read about in the papers between the United States and European Union on matters of trade or other areas, in the Western Balkans, the United States and EU, our policies are in very close alignment. And uh, I think you can look as an example at the process on uh, North Macedonia and its uh, negotiations with Greece, where the United States and European Union uh, closely supported that process and our diplomats were in lockstep. And I would say, to my knowledge, and I'm now outside of State Department, but based on what I see from the outside, I think we're in very close alignment on Serbia and Kosovo. And I would go further and say there are many areas uh, of policy, uh, regionally, economically, counterterrorism, et cetera, where the United States and, and EU on a day-to-day -day basis have an excellent working relationship. You don't read about those things in the paper because they don't make headlines. Uh, but a uh, uh, there's large continuity in the relationship, more than two, something like 200 working groups that the United States and EU are running every year on, on various regional and functional issues. I think at the um, broader level in the relationship, some of the um, disagreements that you've seen over trade are longstanding and predate the current administration, but have to do with the effort to have a more level playing field in trade. And I, for one, am optimistic, having watched this play out over multiple administrations, that the US and EU will eventually reach a commonly agreed set of objectives, sort of a foundation for something like I don't think we're calling it TTIP anymore, but sort of a son, a son or daughter of TTIP. I think that's desirable and, 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 and inevitable. But I do think it's important to um, separate what you're reading in the papers about um, senior level disagreements, particularly over trade, from the day to day of the relationship, which I think has remained strong even through some of the, light, the, the latest uh, storms. Thank you, Wes. Um, <clears throat> we're going to move on now uh, very quickly to the next session, but I have one final question for, for the Prime Minister. Um, your government, Prime Minister, came to power promising to tackle corruption. Um, several years now have passed. 
Can you tell us what results you've had in this area and what, what's next on the agenda? Because that's a, a very hot topic at the moment in, in the country, and I'm sure everybody would like to hear. I think our citizens living the precise examples of fighting against corruption here in the country. There is a few uh, live cases now in the moment where we show for the first time complete independence of judiciary. How they fight with arguments uh, against corruption, how they put uh, in front of uh, uh, judiciary system uh, the, those who are blamed for that and to send a message that really is not painful to do that because uh, fighting against corruption, ruling of law, independent judiciary system immediately for us mean economy. If the investors are sure that they will have a guaranteed justice in the country, normally they will be more motivated to invest. They have estimation for making profit here, but safety, security doesn't mean only from wars or that kind of things. Safety and security mean also justice, the ruling of law, law equal for everybody, and uh, it's possible to achieve these goals here in the country. Uh, we adopt a lot of new legislation. We do that even together with consensus of opposition in the country. Now in the, are in the process pending of implementation of this uh, uh, law, what was part of our reforming process with the European Union. Of course, we need to do a lot in the future. It's an open issue also in member countries how to fight more against corruption, how to increase independence of ju judiciary, and so, and so So also we, Western Balkan countries, and also Republic of North Macedonia, work in this direction very hard, and I think that the, we need even to change our mentality, to have more transparency, to be more in the point of the criticism of our citizens, if we want, in a quicker way, to improve our, our society. Thank you. Um, so we've come to the end of the first session, and um, uh, please join me in thanking uh, both Wes and the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister is going to stay here because we're going to move on quickly to the next session in which I will call the speakers one by one, and I think the Prime Minister will again say something about where we stand now on the EU integration. But thank you very much, Wes. Thank you. Wes. So, Prime Minister, would you like to say a few more words or sh um, uh, about where we stand now? With um, Are you confident um, that you will get the invitation um, in two weeks' time? You know, the whole focus, not only from the citizens of the Republic of North Macedonia, but I think from the whole Balkan here, our focus for the European Union decision now in the middle of, of October. I remember I, I mentioned it in my speech uh, that really the, our neighbors, members of European Union, Greece, Bulgaria, Romania, Croatia, Hungary, Austria, Italy, uh, use opportunity during the United Nations General Assembly to stress and send again a message of the support of Western Balkan and especially Republic of North Macedonia and Albania for our to, to getting data for starting of negotiation. We wait this historical decision 15 years. 15 years being candidate country. But I think that after, na after a lot of processes, what I mentioned, what's happened especially in the last two years, we are really, as, like Commissioner Han mentioned it, shining example here in the region and the confirmation of attraction from, uh, for the European Union. And really, in that way, we will continue. I think that it's also very important for the European Union to have positive decision, because they promised to us. If we deliver, they will deliver. Some member countries have internal debate about enlargement of the European Union, and we understand that. But the first message is that we don't expect immediately to be member country only to get the chance to start negotiation and to start in a quick way to transform our society. Also, the second message is, uh, if they don't decide positively, they will punish the best example in the Europe 
I think not only in the Balkans, what's really happened here, not because of these agreements what we achieve only with Bulgaria and, uh, and Greece, but also everything what's happened here. We are a country with a um, functional institution, democratic institution. We have open dialogue with opposition, successful dialogue with opposition. We have good examples of economy. We are really good example for other region, not only in Europe, but also in the rest of the world. And I think that the minimum what the European Union need to do is to continue in our encouragement, to continue in this direction. So really we are very much focused in this, this specific period, middle of, of October, with help of our friends, our neighbors normally, and we believe uh, that we will finally get the data for starting negotiation with the European Union. Okay, thank you. So I think that's, uh, that's very clear. So let's hear uh, the perspective then from some very important other players. Uh, and first of all, I would like to very much welcome to the stage Alexis Tsipras, former Prime Minister of Greece, leader of the main opposition party, uh, and of course, your interlocutor uh, in this whole process. Um, the two of you are, I believe, shortlisted for the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, so we're going to have two potential, um, uh, well, two actual shortlisted nominees for the Nobel Peace Prize on the stage. But first of all, Alexis, um, uh, uh, Alexis Tsipras will speak in Greek, I believe. Uh, so if you have um, uh, headsets, you can put them on. Uh, welcome to the conference. Θέλω να ευχαριστήσω θερμά τους διοργανωτές που μου έδωσαν την ευκαιρία να βρίσκομαι ξανά εδώ στα Σκόπια για δεύτερη φορά σε λιγότερο από πέντε μήνες να έχω την ευκαιρία να συναντήσω έναν πολύ καλό φίλο, τον Ζόραν, που μέσα από δύσκολες στιγμές καταφέραμε να καταλήξουμε σε μια πολύ σημαντική συμφωνία για τις χώρες μας, για τους λαούς μας, για την περιοχή. Στις αρχές του περασμένου Απρίλη είχα την ευκαιρία να είμαι εδώ σε μια ιστορική επίσκεψη, καθώς ήταν η πρώτη στην ιστορία επίσκεψη Έλληνα Πρωθυπουργού στα Σκόπια και είχαμε την ευκαιρία να εγγενιάσουμε το Ανώτατο Συμβούλιο Συνεργασίας μεταξύ των χωρών μας, αποδεικνύοντας και αναδεικνύοντας τη μεγάλη σημασία που είχε η Συμφωνία των Πρεσπών α, ως μια νέα αφετηρία στις σχέσεις των δύο χωρών. Και επιτρέψτε μου να θυμηθώ ότι εκείνη τη μέρα, όπως και στις 17 Ιουνίου του 18, που ο Νίκος Κοτζιάς και ο Νικολά Δημητρόφ υπέγραψαν τη Συμφωνία των Πρεσπών, όλοι μας είχαμε την αίσθηση ότι γράφουμε ιστορία. Είναι ίσως αντιφατικό, αλλά η συμφωνία αυτή, η πολύπλοκη συμφωνία, με όλους αυτούς τους όρους, τα πολύ επεξηγηματικά άρθρα της, μας επέτρεψε και μας επιτρέπει σήμερα να δώσουμε μια νέα δυναμική στις σχέσεις των δύο χωρών. Και βεβαίως έχουν γίνει πολύ μεγάλα βήματα για την υλοποίηση της συμφωνίας αυτής. Προφανώς παραμένουν κι άλλα που πρέπει να γίνουν, ειδικά σε σχέση με τα αρχαία ελληνικά πολιτιστικά σύμβολα, την εφαρμογή της συμφωνίας που επετέχθη τον Ιούνι για τα σχολικά βιβλία από την Αρμόδια Επιτροπή, αλλά και την πρόοδο που αναμένουμε της Επιτροπής για τα εμπορικά σήματα. Όλοι όμως γνωρίζουμε ότι το πιο αποφασιστικό βήμα έχει ήδη γίνει. Οι χώρες μας δεν είναι, μια, δεν είναι χώρες που η μία έχει την πλάτη γυρισμένη στην άλλη. Και πιστεύω ότι οι λαοί μας σιγά σιγά θα αρχίσουν να βλέπουν τα σημαντικά ωφέλη αυτής της, σημαντικής, αυτής της συμφωνίας. Πιστεύω λοιπόν ότι 
Στόχος από εδώ και στο εξής είναι να οικοδομήσουμε μια αμοιβαία εμπιστοσύνη. Και παράλληλα, να μην αφήσουμε ανεκμετάλλευτη αυτή τη δυναμική για συνεργασία που η ίδια η Συμφωνία δημιούργησε. Μια δυναμική που παρακολουθούμε στην οικονομία, στον τουρισμό, αλλά και σε άλλους τομείς, όπως για παράδειγμα η Άμυνα. Χθες υπεγράφει η Συμφωνία για την αστυνόμευση του εναέριου χώρου της Βόρειας Μακεδονίας από τις ελληνικές, από τα, τις ελληνικές ενόπλες δυνάμεις. Και νομίζω ότι αυτό είναι ένα σημαντικό βήμα εγκαθίδρυσης μιας νέας και ουσιαστικής εμπιστοσύνης μεταξύ μας. Και ελπίζω στο, στο άμεσο μέλλον αυτή τη συνεργασία να την εντείνουμε και στον τομέα του περιβάλλοντος. Θα ήθελα όμως σήμερα να εστιάσω σε αυτή τη δυναμική που δημιουργήθηκε όταν αποφασίσαμε να χτίσουμε αυτή τη σχέση αμοιβαίως σεβασμού και συνεργασίας, κόβοντας τα δεσμά που μας κρατούσαν πίσω όλα τα προηγούμενα χρόνια. Και θα μου επιτρέψετε να θυμηθώ τα λόγια ενός σπουδαίου Έλληνα συγγραφέα του Νίκου Καζαντζάκη μέσω του Αλέξη Ζορμπά, ενός του ήρωα του Καζαντζάκη, ο οποίος ήταν μια πραγματική μια φυσιογνωμία, ένα υπαρκτό πρόσωπο, ο οποίος τα τελευταία χρόνια της ζωής του έζησε και πέθανε εδώ στα Σκόπια και ο τάφος του βρίσκεται εδώ. Έλεγε λοιπόν ο Αλέξης Ζορμπάς, ο ήρωας του Καζαντζάκη, ότι η ελευθερία χρειάζεται και λίγη τρέλα για να μπορέσεις τελικά να κόψεις το σκηνή που σε δένει. Δεν ξέρω αν εγώ και ο Ζόραν είχαμε αρκετή τρέλα τελικά για να προχωρήσουμε σε αυτό το εγχείρημα της συμφωνίας. Πάντως, σίγουρα, και οι δυο μας δεν δεχόμαστε ότι ο, σεβ... ότι ο σεβασμός μας στην ιστορία σημαίνει ότι οι χώρες μας πρέπει να παραμείνουν δεμένες στο παρελθόν, φυλακισμένες στο παρελθόν. Προφανώς, τα δεσμά αυτά σφυριλατήθηκαν στο καμίνι της οικονομικής εξάρτησης, πολέμων, βίας και αίματος στην περιοχή. Τόσο πολύ που η κοινή μας περιοχή, τα Βαλκάνια, δεν είναι τυχαίο ότι είναι συνώνυμο της αντιπαράθεσης και της πολυδιάσπασης. Και ξέρουμε πολύ καλά όλοι ότι ένα μεγάλο μέρος των συγκρούσεων στα Βαλκάνια είχαν να κάνουν με την ευρύτερη γεωγραφική περιοχή της Μακεδονίας. Ξέρουμε πολύ καλά ότι η διαφορά μας για το όνομα αναδύεται από τον πόλεμο της Ιουγκοσλαβίας που αιματοκύλησε την περιοχή για μια δεκαετία και ότι οι εθνοτικές και πολιτικές κρίσεις στα Δυτικά Βαλκάνια συνεχίζουν να απειλούν το μέλλον της περιοχής. Επιπλέον όμως τα τελευταία χρόνια είχαμε και έχουμε να αντιμετωπίσουμε και την κρίση που περνάει μία όλο και πιο εσωστρεφής και επιτρέψτε μου τον όρο σκοτεινή Ευρώπη. Με το Brexit, την αναζωπήρωση των εθνικισμών, την άνοδο των δυνάμεων που θέλουν την εθνική περιχαράκωση, την άνοδο της ακροδεξιάς, αλλά ταυτόχρονα και την ενίσχυση των ανισοτήτων. Θυμίζω λοιπόν πώς συνδυάστηκαν οι αρνητικές εξελίξεις στα Βαλκάνια τα τελευταία χρόνια με αυτήν ακριβώς την κρίση στην Ευρώπη. Την περίοδο 2014-2017, η Ευρωπαϊκή Ένωση χτυπημένη από την οικονομική κρίση και έχοντας πια μπει σε μια μακρά πορεία εσωστρέφειας, πάγωσε τη διαδικασία της διεύρυνσης. Περάσαμε τη χειρότερη προσφυγική κρίση μετά τον Δεύτερο Παγκόσμιο Πόλεμο, με ισχυρές αντιπαραθέσεις μεταξύ μας στο λεγόμενο Βαλκανικό Δρόμο, με δυνάμεις που επέβαλαν το κλείσιμο της Βαλκανικής Οδού, το κλείσιμο των συνόρων, και απέρριψαν στην πράξη την ευρωπαϊκή αλληλεγγύη. Υπήρξαν παράλληλα σοβαρές πολιτικές και εθνοτικές κρίσεις στο Μαυροβούνιο, στη Βόρεια Μακεδονία αλλά και στην Αλβανία, ενώ δυνάμεις με αλότριους στόχους για τα Βαλκάνια ενισχύθηκαν. Παράλληλα, δεν υπήρχε καμία δυναμική αμυγός περιφερειακή πρωτοβουλία συνεργασίας στα Βαλκάνια. Το δύσκολο, λοιπόν, για τα Βαλκάνια και την περιοχή μας 2017 
Εμείς προσπαθήσαμε, να δω, να, κόντρα στο ρεύμα της περίοδου, να δημιουργήσουμε προϋποθέσεις συνεργασίας απέναντι στις κυρίαρχες δυνάμεις του εθνικισμού και της εσωστρέφειας στην Ευρώπη και στα Βαλκάνια. Θυμάμαι ότι τον Ιούλη του 2017, Συναντηθήκαμε για πρώτη φορά, με τους, συναντήθηκα εγώ με τους Πρωθυπουργούς της Βουργαρίας και της, Ελβ... και της Σερβίας στη Θεσσαλονίκη και τον Οκτώβη του 2017 στη Βάρνα, που στην πρωτοβουλία μας είχε προσθεθεί και η Ρουμανία. Και τότε αισθανόμασταν ότι υπήρχε ένα μεγάλο πολιτικό κενό στην ευρωπαϊκή πολιτική. Και συμφωνήσαμε τότε ότι δεν υπήρχε άλλος δρόμος από την αναζωογόνηση της Ευρωπαϊκής Προοπτικής των Δυτικών Βαλκανίων. Και συμφωνήσαμε ότι η Βουλγαρία, η Βουλγαρία που αναλάμβανε την Προεδρία το 18 και η Ρουμανία που αναλάμβανε το 19 θα έβαζαν τα Δυτικά Βαλκάνια ψηλά στις προτεραιότητές τους. Και θα προωθούσαμε νέα δίκτυα ενέργειας και μεταφορών στην περιοχή και βεβαίως ότι η Βουλγαρία θα διοργάνωνε μια σύνοδο αφιερωμένη στην ενταξιακή προοπτική των Δυτικών Βαλκανίων, αναζωογονώντας την ατζέντα της Θεσσαλονίκης το 2003. Θυμίζω επίσης ότι μέσα στον 1,5 χρόνο που ακολούθησε, πραγματοποιήθηκαν πάνω από 8 συναντήσεις αυτών των περιφερειακών σχημάτων. Ενώ την ίδια στιγμή η Ελλάδα συμφώνησε ένα διαπραγματευτικό πλαίσιο με την Αλβανία, που όταν... Τη Ρήτο θα, έπρεπε, θα επέτρεπε μάλλον τη στήριξη της Ευρωπαϊκής Προοπτικής της Αλβανίας. Παράλληλα στο πλαίσιο της Διεθνούς Έκθεσης Θεσσαλονίκης με τη μόμενη χώρα της ΗΠΑ, αναδείχθηκαν οι προοπτικές για οικονομική συνεργασία και συνανάπτυξη στα Βαλκάνια με επίκεντρο τη Θεσσαλονίκη. Σε αυτό λοιπόν το πνεύμα των αντικειμενικών δυσκολιών στην Ευρώπη και στα Βαλκάνια, αλλά και μιας ισχυρής βούλησης των κυβερνήσεων των Βαλκανίων για συνεργασία, συναντηθήκαμε με τον Ζόραν Ζάεφ στον Ταβός τον Γενάρη του 2018. Και συμφωνήσαμε ότι έπρεπε να προσπαθήσουμε, να μην χάσουμε αυτή την ευκαιρία, να βρούμε μια αμοιβαία αποδεκτή λύση στο ζήτημα του ονόματος. Η Συμφωνία των Βρεσπών, λοιπόν, σηματοδοτεί μια κρίσιμη καμπή, θετική καμπή, για τις ευρωπαϊκές και περιφερειακές εξελίξεις τα τελευταία χρόνια, για μια σειρά από λόγους. Πρώτον, γιατί συμβολίζει την νίκη της διπλωματίας σε μια περίοδο που η αξία της διπλωματίας αμφισβητείται συνεχώς. Μια νίκη της διπλωματίας και της συνεννόησης απέναντι στις δυνάμεις του εθνικισμού, απέναντι στις δυνάμεις της αδράνειας και της εθνικής περιχαράκωσης. Η συμφωνία αυτή βασίστηκε στον αμοιβαίο σεβασμό και βασίστηκε και σε ένα κλίμα εντυνόμενης βαλκανικής συνεργασίας. Δεν βασίστηκε στο δίκαιο του ισχυρού, στην ήττα της μιας πλευράς α, μετά από α, μονομερείς ενέργειες ή μετά από συγκρούσεις πολεμικές ή στην επιβολή τρίτων δυνάμεων. Και βεβαίως ήταν σημαντικός και ο ρόλος του ΟΗΕ και του ειδικού απεσταλμένου του Μάτιου Νίμιτς, που αναδεικνύει την αξία του οργανισμού σε μια περίοδο που αμφισβητείται. Δεύτερον, η συμφωνία αναδεικνύει την αξία της Ευρωπαϊκής Ένωσης, η ένταξη στην οποία αποτελεί αναπόσπαστο κομμάτι της συμφωνίας. Και η συμφωνία επιβεβαιώνει το ίδιο το διακύβευμα του ευρωπαϊκού εγχειρήματο την εξασφάλιση δηλαδή και την εξάπλωση της ειρήνης και της ευημερία. Και η προσπάθεια της Βόρειας Μακεδονίας αντανακλά τον τρόπο με τον οποίο οφείλει να προωθείται η διεύρυνση. Τέθηκαν συγκεκριμένα κριτήρια βασισμένα στο ευρωπαϊκό κεκτημένο, τα οποία όμως η Βόρεια Μακεδονία υλοποίησε. Αποτελεί λοιπόν μείζον ζήτημα αξιοπιστίας της Ευρωπαϊκής Ένωσης, να δώσει το πράσινο φως στην έναρξη των ενταξιακών, ε, της ενταξιακής διαδικασίας στο επόμενο Ευρωπαϊκό Συμβούλιο. Έπρεπε από το προηγούμενο να έχει επαρθεί η απόφαση. Η Ευρωπαϊκή Ένωση οφείλει να αποδράσει από την εσωστρέφειά της και να δώσει το μήνυμα 
ότι αποτελεί όντω μια ισχυρή παγκόσμια δύναμη που μπορεί να προωθήσει την ειρήνη και τη σταθερότητα στη γειτονιά τη. Που μπορεί να αρχίσει να κλείνει οριστικά πια τι μεγάλε πληγέ που άφησε πίσω του ο πόλεμο στη Ιουγκοσλαβία. Αν η Ευρωπαϊκή Ένωση δεν μπορεί να προωθήσει την ειρήνη στη γειτονιά τη, στα Δυτικά Βαλκάνια, να παίξει έναν καθοριστικό ρόλο στη γειτονιά τη, πώ θα μπορέσει να παίξει ένα καθοριστικό και κρίσιμο ρόλο στη διεθνή σκηνή σε άλλα μέρη του κόσμου. Και τέλος, η Συμφωνία των Πρεσπών αναδεικνύει την αξία που έχει, ειδικά στην εποχή μας, να τολμάμε να λαμβάνουμε γενναίες προοδευτικές αποφάσεις που έχουν ανάγκη λέει μας, αψηφώντας το πολιτικό κόστος. Τη σημασία που έχει να βρισκόμαστε σε κρίσιμε στιγμέ στη σωστή πλευρά τη ιστορία ασχέτω του τιμήματο. Γι' αυτό τον λόγο η έναρξη, πιστεύω, τη ανταξιακή διαδικασία θα αποτελέσει ένα σημαντικό μήνυμα και για άλλε κυβερνήσει και για άλλου λαού που αντιμετωπίζουν δυσκολίε και διενέξει στην περιοχή μα και πέρα από αυτή να τολμήσουν. Πριν λίγε μέρε ο ο φίλος Μοζόραν τόνισε, και θέλω να κλείσω με αυτό, ότι η Συμφωνία των Πρεσπών είναι μια μεγάλη ευκαιρία για την Ελλάδα, διότι της δίνει τη δυνατότητα να αναλάβει και πάλι ηγετικό ρόλο στα Βαλκάνια. Επιτρέψτε μου να κλείσω με αυτό. Αυτός πιστεύω ότι πρέπει να είναι ο ρόλος της Ελλάδας στην περιοχή, όπως ήταν σε όλες τις δύσκολες στιγμές της βαλκανικής ιστορίας όπως τον 18ο αιώνα, ο Ρίγας Φεραίος οραματίστηκε τη συνεργασία των λαών της Βαλκανικής, αλλά και τον αγώνα τους για ανεξαρτησία που ακολούθησε. Όπως έκανε η Ελλάδα στο Μεσοπόλεμο, με τη διπλωματία του Ελευθέριου Βενιζέλου και τις πρωτοβουλίες του Αλέξανδρου Παναστασίου για βαλκανικές συνδιασκέψεις στους τομείς της οικονομίας, του πολιτισμού, του αθλητισμού, και όπως έκανε η Ελλάδα και εν μέσω του ψυχρού πολέμου με τις διπλωματικές πρωτοβουλίες και του Κωνσταντίνου Καραμαλή αλλά κυρίως του Ανδρέα Παπανδρέου όπως έκανε το 2003 με την ατζέντα της Θεσσαλονίκης. Σε αυτή την κατεύθυνση πιστεύω ότι πρέπει να κινηθεί η χώρα μου το επόμενο διάστημα. Και γι' αυτό πιστεύω ότι ή μάλλον δεσμεύομαι ότι σε αυτή την κατεύθυνση θα συνεχίσουν να εργάζονται παρά τις δυσκολίες και να δουλεύουν οι προοδευτικές δυνάμεις στην περιοχή. Και ας μην ξεχνάμε, αυτή η συμφωνία, αυτό το σημαντικό βήμα επετεύχθη διότι είχαμε την ευτυχή συγκυρία να βρίσκονται δύο προοδευτικές κυβερνήσεις και στην Ελλάδα και στη Βόρεια Μακεδονία. Σε αυτή την κατεύθυνση λοιπόν πιστεύω ότι πρέπει να κινηθούν όλες οι κυβερνήσεις της περιοχής και το σήμα που πρέπει να δώσει η Ευρωπαϊκή Ένωση πρέπει να είναι σαφές και να είναι σήμα αισιοδοξία. Σας ευχαριστώ θερμά. Uh, Martin Schulz, former president of the European Parliament and, of course, former leader of the Social Democratic Party of Germany. Please welcome Martin to the stage. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for the speeches of Alexis and uh, Zoran. I want to honor, first of all, this, uh, in my eyes, real, really historical step and uh, the historical commitment of these two leaders. And I want to speak about the two personalities because they did something which is, in my eyes, missing all over in the world and uh, especially in the European Union, to be courageous and to be so courageous to sacrifice, if it is necessary, the own position to achieve a goal. They could lose both. Alexis, at the end, had an enormous resistance in its own country 
against the Prespa agreement, but he stick to what he promised, even running the risk to lose, but saying publicly, this is my position, it is necessary, it is good for my country, it is good for my nation. And so on did the same. And if we speak about the problem, if the European Union is granting on the 15th of October, really opening the access negotiation to North Macedonia and to Albania, I want to draw a line from this commitment of the two people present here to the tactical games always played in the European Council. I cannot guarantee here if it is granted to you on the 15th of October. I hope so. I did the utmost I could do as a member of the German Parliament for a positive vote in the German Parliament last week. It is a strong signal that the German Parliament gives Angela Merkel a mandate to say go ahead in the European Council. But it is not sure. It is the German Parliament. What the Dutch Parliament will say to Mr. Rutte, I don't know. If Mr. Kurz, after his uh, victory in the election in Vienna, is now uh, free to go ahead, or if he must uh, consider that he can't give an agreement before he has not yet built a new government, I don't know. My experience in the European Union is that, on one hand, everybody knows that we need progress in a style he was made here in the region, especially between Greece and North Macedonia on one hand, and on the other side, the European Union member states and the institutions in Brussels itself are uncertain about the future of the European Union. The European election won those parties in France and in Italy who want to destroy the European Union. Marine Le Pen is a woman openly saying no to the Euro, abolish the European integration. Mr. Salvini, long-serving interior and deputy, deputy prime minister and minister of interior in Italy said, let's come to an end with the European Union. No dictatorship from Brussels. It's not Salvini. This is the prime minister of Hungary. The United Kingdom is a G7 country, a veto power of the Security Council of the United Nations, leaving the European Union with a prime minister who is praising the future cooperation between the United States and Great Britain as an example how to fight against the European Union. We heard Mr. Mitchell, in your speech about Russia and China and the strategy of these two, two countries here in the region. But the President of the United States is openly declaring NATO as irrelevant and the European Union as an economic enemy with a certain resonance within the European Union of those parties I just mentioned, and of some prime ministers leaving the European Union, also some who are remaining within the European Union with the strategy we take every money, every advantage, we contribute to nothing for deepening the integration. The European Union is in a bad shape. And that's the biggest problem, that we on one hand, everybody in Brussels and in the national Capitals know we need a deepening of European integration. To tackle the challenges of the 21st century, we need more European cooperation, more integration. China, let's speak about figures. China has 1.4 billion inhabitants. India has 1.1 billion inhabitants. These two countries together, 2.5 billion citizens it's around a third of world population. My country, the biggest member states of the European Union, Germany has 82 million inhabitants. The country Guy Verhofstadt was prime minister for nine years, Belgium has 11 million inhabitants. Yeah, you are going up. This is a good news. Yeah. 
You are going up, but uh, first of all, you have to look who is going more up, the Melodians or the Flemish. So, to speak about the real, the real problems. No, what we need is more courage. We need more ambition. We need more to refer to what the, the founding fathers and mothers of the European Union did against a lot of resistance. I'm a German, as you know. I'm born in the western part of Germany, at the western border of Germany to Belgium and to the Netherlands and to Luxembourg. I have family in the Netherlands, I have family in Belgium and in Germany. When we had family feasts, there was three nations together. And in the post-war atmosphere, I was born and grew up. The Second World War was not yet forgotten. And those people in Germany, in Belgium, in Luxembourg, in France, in the Netherlands, suggested to their citizens, after all the crimes committed by Germans in their country, we must reconciliate with Germany. The Germans will get more money from the Marshall Fund than we get. Because without a democratic and sustainable, developed democratic, economic, stable country, Germany, in the middle of the continent, we will never have peace. There was a lot of people against. Your predecessor, the prime minister, like Spark, who made these suggestions to the citizens in Belgium, they shouted on him. Go away, these Germans, twice they occupied our country, they destroyed everything, and now we should cooperate with them? Never. And they said, yes, you must. And even if we will lose the next uh, election, we will do it. We signed these agreements. And what they created was a period of wealth and peace without pre any precedent in history. But they were prepared to run for their conviction and not to play tactical games. And this is the problem of the European Union for the time being. To be open to the arguments of the opponents, okay, to take into account the interdependencies of the 21st century nationally and internationally, okay, to look to economy, to look to social stability, to look to cultural development, always First of all, looking to the interest of my partner, of my neighbor, and then coming to my own, and then finding a balance between it. But to be prepared to run at the end for the result and to fight for it. This is what we need. And uh, Assistant Secretary Mitchell allow me to say, also in relation to the United States of America, taking into account the President of the United States and its strategy towards Europe. I think there is a lot of prime ministers in this region hoping that they will never get a phone call from the White House. What we need is, and therefore I'm quite outspoken, the United States of America are a risk for the European integration with that government. I hope that they will be re replaced by another government in a foreseeable time. It's my real hope, because for the time being, I can't see a close cooperation, even if Mr. Pompeo, Secretary Pompeo, will come to the region between the United States and Europe. Also coming from these turbulent times in Washington, and I have to admit, also from the, coming from the uncertainty of the European Union. So for me, to close, we need the enlargement of the European Union. We need the stabilization of the region. We need the opening of the access negotiation more than ever. But I'm honest. I'm not sure that it will go as fast as I make my suggestions here. Because instead of courageous steps, we see in Brussels, and especially in the European Council, not so much in the European Parliament, not so much in the European Co Commission, but especially in the European Council of Heads of States and Government, this kind of tactical reluctance, which is at the end not the solution of this uh,
problems internally and worldwide. What we need at the end is what we need at the end is uh, courageous steps like these two men did. Thank you very much. Uh, lots of issues raised there, and um, some controversial questions too. Um, so, Wes made the point in the earlier session, this is a question for you, Prime Minister, and you, um, Alexis. Um, he made an important point that PRESPA was not the result of external intervention, but was truly a local or regional initiative. So it came from here, uh, which is not the way it's often seen. Um, you know, outside of, 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 of the Balkans. It's often seen as the result more of external pressure. So I was very interested to hear, Alexis, your, the way it was very, it was fascinating to hear how this process came about. But um, is that the way that you two see it too? Or was it a bit of both external pressure um, or was it much more a personal dynamic between uh, the two of you? So, who wants to go first? Okay, let me say that before I became Prime Minister, uh, my party was a small, let's say, party at the left of the political scene. And my party was not so close to the US strategy in the region especially the war in Yugoslavia. <laughs> but at the same time, from these days, we were in favor and we fought it for reconciliation, for peace and cooperation in the region. And we were in these difficult times in the uh, 1990s that uh, we were in favor of an agreement between our two countries. So this was not something that was imposed from external forces. It was our ideas. And uh, the fact that we were in the power and the fact that uh, the left was in the government in Greece, it was an opportunity for us to try to implement our agenda. So this agreement is very compatible with our ideological uh, principles. And that's why, from the very beginning, I tried to cut the, the, the opportunity after Zora became prime minister. But of course, not uh, focusing uh, in our uh, ideas, but uh, in the, let's say, national line that have uh, been created uh, the last 15 years. So we didn't do any step out of this line. That's why it was difficult to have an agreement. And it was difficult for Zoran as well to change the constitution. But I think that uh, 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 this agreement uh, has been done, uh, first of all, because uh, of our willingness to have the agreement and not uh, for external uh, forces or not for uh, uh, technical details uh, during the negotiation but because of our willingness. Okay, thank you. Prime Minister Zai. I can only confirm everything what Alexis mentioned. It. We do disagreement. We make a deal. Of course, our strategic partners always was here to encourage, but that was happened publicly. Go forward. If you really believe it's really bring a benefit for both countries, for both nations, do it. Uh, I remember Alexis mentioned it, first meeting of us in uh, Davos, we prepared there in this meeting the, the picture and the frame of the agreement. After that, we work harder and we achieve agreement. But both sides believe that will bring a benefits. We was aware of the risk, of political risk during this momentum. But uh, the value of the future, to open the borders, to open the future possibility for cooperation, for the young people, for children, for next generation. It's a precious one. It's a precious goal. And I think that we achieved that. Uh, citizens from North Macedonia are now feeling that. Citizens from Greece will feel it. Why we feel it? Because uh, immediately, because we have 
uh, reach our goals. NATO membership, we are very close. We hope end of this year, beginning of next year, we will be full member. And also European Union integration, really. And there is economic benefits also coming here. Also, the Greek citizens start feeling, and there will be more and more positive feelings what the agreement will, will bring to the, to the citizens of the both sides. But really, we believe in this moment so much, so it was no important what kind of political price will happen or not. We agree to, that we need to take care of each other, to guarantee and to protect both sides' interests, I take care for Alexis, Alexis take care for me, because he must pass through the institutions, I must pass through the institutions. And when the both sides honestly need to achieve agreement, they take care of each other until end. And even now, for the implementation of this agreement, we take care and we find a way always to break through the obstacles and to continuing implementation of, of the agreement. Okay, thank you. So the next question is um, for the two of you is, um, were you surprised um, by the delay in, in, in June? And uh, for you, Martin Schulz, I was interested that you referred to the problem as uh, technical games. Technical, I said. Te tactical. Sorry? Tactical. Not technical. Tactical, okay. I thought you said technical, <laughs> tactical. I'm not, I, I see that as political, you know, political games, if you like, to do with um, the state of the union, as, as, as you talked about. And um, in a way, I, you can say that you, un, 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 unlike these two, you are out of time or out of step with um, what is going on in, across the EU at the moment, where we see these uh, vociferous tendencies, disintegrative uh, tendencies, and this insurgency of other populist parties and so on. And that's the context, the unfortunate context in which um, the Western Balkans is now uh, waiting um, uh, for, a, for a positive decision. So were you surprised, the, the, the two of you, that there was um, a delay in June? Be honest I'm now. never surprised <laughs> with the delays in you, with the experience of four and a half years in the European Council. So I know that the main strategy in uh, the Council is uh, too little too late. So uh, I think that uh, unfortunately, and this is the existential drama of European Union, uh, uh, EU is not uh, politically ready yet for brave steps forward. And I think that this is, uh, this is the difficulty of its future, how we can uh, put in a common line all these different approaches, different lights and political, uh, and uh, the political cost in any uh, different country. Because I think that, and this is the, the message of this agreement. The message of this agreement is in, in serious uh, issues, we have to uh, avoid and uh, not underestimate, but avoid the political cost. This is not the rule in European Union. So the reason why we have this delay, it is not uh, technical, it is tactical. <laughs> it is not uh, the excuse of uh, the, the, the German parliament that was not ready to discussing to vote for that, but uh, uh, the preparation had not uh, been done and uh, uh, there were political developments, uh, the elections in Austria and the communication between uh, significant parts of, of the council and this was the, the reason of the delay. But I believe that everybody has to understand that uh, there is no other option than to have a decision in order to give the correct signal, not to the North Macedonian, uh, not to the North, to North Macedonian Albania, but also in other countries that need, and people in the region that need incentive to make brave steps for their side. Prime Minister. Uh, there was uh, some kind of message that is possible delay, but why? Because of European Parliament election. The, the report was uh, postponed 
to be emitted for the candidate countries after the European Parliament election. So the, they, they released a report in 29 of, of uh, May, and the Bundestag have a session between 30 and 6 of, of uh, May, for example. First, I understand that normally, because of dignity, because of matter of, uh, of, the, of the substance of the report, uh, parliamentarians need to, to, to have enough time to read. But even Bundestag parliamentarians and European Parliament and other parliaments, uh, parliamentarians from the national parliaments of European Union country follow the situation in North Macedonia and Albania. Uh, that was some kind of, of, of excuse uh, for postponing. But really I think that there was a reason. Europe need more time. I think the management between Germany and France and Netherlands, what will really happen with Austria, all these kind of aspects was uh, needed arguments for postponing the decision till middle of October. And, uh, but I believe now that it's more clear situation. What is very important, really the, the good examples uh, need to be awarded, not punished. Because even European Union and the whole world expect next step, solving a Kosovo issue, for example. How they will encourage President Vucic and President Taci to find solution. If they punish this good example, how they will try enough courage for the reforms inside of the European Union if they don't award best uh, or good examples here. So one of the reasons why I believe that there will be positive decision for Republic of North Macedonia and also for Albania, it's that we must move forward. Europe must keep uh, arguments to be good example. Never forget why the European Union is consisted, is uh, constructed normally, because to, to, to be powerful part of the world, to be leader of the world, and, role, and really the, the Balkans, uh, especially Western Balkan countries, can be he very helpful in that way. Thank you. So, uh, Martin, will, will the EU lose all credibility if it doesn't extend this invitation in October in this region? For sure. It's for sure the, the, the answer is yes. I think uh, uh, in our individual life we should stick to our promises and uh, in political life as well. I hope that in uh, mid-October in the Council uh, the uh, opening of the access negotiation will be decided. It was promised, it was postponed, uh, but uh, I hope uh, that it will not be postponed once more. But my experience uh, after uh, three decades in, in, European, <laughs> in European institutions and politics is nothing as predictable. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I don't know what will happen. Listen, yesterday, I, we, we, yesterday happened the funeral of uh, a, big, a great statesman in France, of Jacques Girac. And I saw Guy Verhofstadt on the funeral, and I, I remembered when in 2005, in France, the referendum happened about the European Constitution. Guy and I, we were the leaders of the two groups, of the Liberal and the Social Democratic group in the European Parliament. And we urged Girac to be more engaged because it was uh, perceivable that there was a resistance. I, I, in Paris, I spoke with a man, and he said, a taxi driver said to me, you are a European uh, uh, representative, yes. You should know I'm against the Constitution. So, and I said, uh, did you read it? No. Hmm. So, uh, why you are against? I'm against, because I'm against Chirac. He was on the deepest point of his popularity in the country. And I said to Guy in this time, if he will say, vote yes, and I resign, I resign we will win uh, the referendum. In France, they voted about everything, but not about the referendum. But the referendum, no. In France and the Netherlands, put the European Union in a disaster, which have not yet recovered until today. That was the beginning of a decline of European integration. Therefore, I mention it. And since then, it started that uh, leaders played with European questions national games. The last one who led us in a disaster by playing that game was David Cameron. 
to survive as a prime minister. He promised to the radicals in the Conservative Party a referendum. And when we asked him, I asked him, you remember very well, what are you doing there? He said, ah, be quiet. These are the stupid guys of my, I have to give them something. Never they will win. So the result is known. It was a domestic game with a disaster as a result for the European Union. Therefore, to answer to your question, I hope, I'm relatively sure that they will vote on the 15th of October in favor. But if you would uh, get a guarantee from me today, <laughs> I think even no single member of the European Council could give you a guarantee. But I think after the signal of that the Germans and the French are in favor, I hope that there is now a, a boost in that question. Thank you. We haven't really spoken much about uh, Albania, and, and maybe that's not fair. We should also talk a little bit about um, Albania this, this morning. And um, Albania is also hoping uh, for an invitation, even if it is a conditional in, in invitation. Um, do you think it's fair, actually, that um, two countries should be taken together in this way in tandem, um, or should each country not be treated on its own merits? <laughs> so, <laughs> so for Zoran, it's no, uh, more uh, difficult it's, to answer. It's but perhaps <laughs> difficult for him. Yeah. Uh, but okay we, yeah, okay, we are not those who decide. Uh, First, uh, we can help each other if we have a, a common uh, uh, chance to go for a negotiation process. It's a journey. We can help each other. Normally, we will be focused that we can help each other. European Union has a merit system, and this merit system must bring results normally. We was very happy also for Albania when the Bundestag sent a message, positive message, not only for us, also for Albania. Of course, uh, our expectation is uh, through this merit system to, to get uh, uh, promised uh, delivery from European Union uh, because we really deliver. In this uh, occasion, normally we are very much focused how to, to encourage those countries who are not yet uh, very sure of the final decision and, but they will must make decision first in the Ministerial Council 15 and 16, and after that European Council 17 and, and, and 18. So in this direction, I believe that is a mainly global message. Really, my friend Teddy Rama deserved. Yes, he need to do a lot. We need to do a lot also. But that is, will be faster, will be quicker, will be in the best way, through the negotiation process. That will transform our society quicker to be, as soon as possible, complete members of European Union. Okay, thank you. So hopefully the two countries has to take, uh, at the same time, the green line for the accession process. But this is not necessarily in any case. So I mean, uh, the two countries are two different cases. We're working, and uh, I, because Eddie is a good friend of mine as well as Zoran is, and I tried to convince him uh, not to cover himself behind Zoran, but to do uh, progress in the reforms, in the necessary reforms, and especially in relation with the, Greek, uh, the, the rights of the Greek minority in Albania. And I think that he tried to do uh, steps forward, even though he has a lot to do uh, more in the future. But uh, let's, let's think that uh, uh, the, the green light for, for the accession process is not the end of the road, it's the beginning of the road. So there are uh, so many things to be done in the future. So I believe that uh, this is something that we have to think, we have to give a, uh, intensive to, to these countries and to these uh, people, and especially for North Macedonia, where, uh, as uh, Zoran said, North Macedonia is the uh, good paradigm for the others. So we have to uh, be fair to them. And if this uh, has to be done also for Albania in order to give incentives to do more reforms, the better. 
Thank you, Martin. These little, to consider uh, uh, the, the uh, conditions of every country, uh, this is, is quite clear, and to, to, to build packages is also normal. Remember, between 2000 and 2004, we negotiated with uh, 10 countries together in the central and eastern part of Europe, from the Baltic states to uh, uh, Slovenia. Uh, the only country which was not belonging to that region was Malta in that time. Or when the Scandinavian countries, it was uh, Sweden, uh, Norway, and Finland, was uh, negotiated together. Norway we then uh, stepped out, and uh, this is, I think, normal. And it makes, in a, in a certain way, also, also sense here in the region to discuss to the same moment uh, with uh, different countries, even if the problems uh, and the, the, the uh, internal structures and the, the conditions of the countries are very heterogeneous, it is nevertheless a part of a whole region. Uh, and you must always think in European uh, access negotiations from the end, what will happen if, I take the example, North Macedonia will be a member of the European Union and Albania not. Creates immediately more problems. We saw this in a very difficult way um, with Slovenia already being a member state of the European Union, Croatia not. Today, Croatia and Slovenia are members of the European Union, Serbia not. It is always uh, uh, better to have uh, regional uh, integrated solutions than to separate the negotiations. That's it's in my eyes. Uh, serious approach. Okay, thank you uh, very much. Now, um, we're going to stick with um, this discussion, but after the break, we're having a coffee break now for half an hour. We're going to come back yes. to, to this question uh, uh, of the EU and its role and the integration process, and also NATO and security and hopefully there'll be an opportunity to pursue some of the questions you raised, Martin, about the role of the US and the EU in the region. Maybe we didn't get a chance now, but I think there's something we need to discuss there. So we've got half an hour, ladies and gentlemen. Please reconvene. A round of applause, please, for all our speakers this morning. <laughs>